Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video we're going to introduce the popular runge kutta family of methods for numerically integrating ordinary differential equations to high accuracy. We'll take a look at several example runge kutta methods, and we'll perform some analytical calculations and also look at a few computer demos. runge kutta methods are another type of one-step discretization, and they're a very popular choice. And in the runge kutta methods, when we're taking a time step from tk to tk plus 1, the aim is that we'll make several evaluations of our right-hand side function f and combine them in a way that will achieve higher-order accuracy. And runge kutta methods all fit within a general framework that can be described in terms of butcher tableaus that we'll talk about later on in this video. And we'll first look at two different runge kutta examples. We we'll look at the case when we make two evaluations of our function f, and then at the case when we make four evaluations of our function f. Let's now look at the general form of runge kutta methods with two intermediate evaluations. And so here, our numerical solution yk plus 1 can be written in terms of yk plus h times a multiplied by k1 plus b multiplied by k2. And here, k1 and k2 are our two intermediate evaluations of f. And specifically, k1 evaluates f at the start of the interval, so k1 equals f of tk comma yk, and k2 evaluates f at some point within our interval and also incorporates information from k1. So k2 is equal to f of tk plus alpha h comma yk plus beta h K1. So it's worth noting that there's some unfortunate notation here that's common in this area of the literature. K is used both to index the numerical time step as a subscript, and K is also used to represent these intermediate quantities where we evaluate our function f. Thankfully, though, it's usually OK not to get these confused because when k is used as a subscript, that's exclusively for indexing the time step. And when it's used not as a subscript, that's exclusively for representing these intermediate quantities. So in this general form, we now have four free parameters, a, b, alpha, and beta. And it's worth noting here that the first order forward Euler method is a member of this runge kutta family if we put that a is equal to 1 and b is equal to 0. And in that case, k2 will be ignored and we'll just get our solution from k1. So now we'll look at the truncation error of these runge kutta methods and we'll determine what conditions we have to apply to a, b, alpha, and beta in order to achieve second-order accuracy. Let's now look at deriving the conditions that our two-step runge kutta method needs to satisfy in order to achieve second-order accuracy. And we'll consider taking a step from yk to yk plus 1 with step size h, and we'll make two intermediate function evaluations, k1, which is equal to f of tk and yk, and k2, which is equal to f of tk plus alpha h, and yk plus beta h k1. And so a key idea with runge kutta methods is to incorporate previous intermediate steps into subsequent ones, and this can help us achieve higher order accuracy. Once we've evaluated k1 and k2, then we will evaluate our numerical solution yk plus 1 in terms of yk plus h times a k1 plus b k2. And our aim here is to find our four parameters alpha, beta, a, and b, so that our method is second order accurate. So we'll begin by putting that our mathematical solution y of tk is equal to yk, our numerical solution, and we will then Taylor expand our mathematical solution. And we know here that tk plus 1 is equal to tk plus h. 
And therefore, if we look at y of tk plus 1, then this will be equal to y of tk plus hy prime of tk plus h squared over 2 y double prime of tk plus o h cubed terms. And to proceed, we can replace this derivative y prime with f because it satisfies our mathematical ODE. So we can write this as y of tk plus h times f of tk yk at plus h squared over 2. And we can now do the same thing again to this term. We've got two derivatives of y, so we can write this then as d by dt applied to our y prime, and we can replace that with f of t and y of t, again using this equation. And that will be evaluated at t is equal to tk, and we'll also have order h cubed terms. So now let's look at this term here. We have a derivative of this function f, and there are two terms here that depend on t. We have an explicit t dependence, and then we also have a t dependence through the y of t term. And therefore, if we evaluate this, we will get two terms that emerge. And we're going to write f subscript t to be the partial derivative of f with respect to the t variable, and f subscript y to be the partial derivative of f with respect to the y variable. So we'll first get a partial derivative with respect to the t variable, and that will give us f t t k y k. And we'll then get a derivative from this y of t term, we'll have the chain rule, so we'll get a y prime term, and then an fy of tk and yk. And again, we can now replace this y prime term using our mathematical ODE, and that will then give us our expression y of tk plus h times f of tk and yk plus h squared over 2 ft tk yk plus f tk yk fy tk yk plus o h cubed terms. So now let's look at our numerical solution. And that will involve a combination of k1 and k2 K1 is straightforward to deal with, since we already have this expression. But let's look now at K2, and we will tailor expand K2. And we have an expression for k1 here, so we can write this as f of tk yk plus alpha h f t tk yk plus beta h f tk yk 
Fy Tk Yk. And therefore, we know that yk plus 1 is equal to yk plus h a plus b f tk yk plus alpha b h squared f t tk yk plus beta b h squared f tk yk f y tk yk plus o h cubed so now let's look at the conditions for second order accuracy And what we'll do here is we'll compare our numerical expansion with our mathematical expansion. And so we've got three different terms that emerge in our two expansions. So first, let's look at the terms proportional to f themselves. So here, we have this term that involves f, and we have this term that involves f. And that therefore tells us that a plus b is equal to 1. And now we have a term that involves ft, and a term that involves ft over here, and that tells us that alpha b is equal to a half. And finally, we have a term that involves ffy, and another term that involves ffy over here, and that therefore tells us that beta b is equal to a half as well. And it's interesting that we have now three conditions, but we have four unknown parameters, and therefore we have some freedom to select these four parameters. And there are actually several different choices that are popular to make, and we'll take a look at several of these in a moment. Another thing that's interesting is that even though we're looking at second-order accuracy, we see that three conditions emerge. And this happens because when we perform these Taylor series, we find that multiple terms emerge here. We could follow the same procedures to derive higher order methods. However, we actually find that there is a proliferation of terms in these Taylor series. And therefore, there are more and more coefficients in the Taylor expansion that we need to match. And it becomes increasingly complicated to find methods of higher accuracy. There is actually some beautiful theory behind the structure of the terms in the Taylor series, and I cover that in my spring course, Applied Math 225, and that can be very helpful for determining all of the order conditions that our methods must satisfy. We've now derived the conditions that our four parameters a, b, alpha, and beta have to satisfy in order to achieve second-order accuracy. And we saw that we needed to impose three constraints, and that therefore provides us with some freedom in selecting these parameters. And within the permissible parameters, there are actually three sets of parameters that lead to methods that have names. Firstly, if a equals 0 and b equals 1, and alpha and beta are both half, this leads to the modified Euler method. And because a equals zero, this actually leads to some saving in the number of floating point operations that are required in order to implement this method. The second set of name parameters comes when a and b are both equal to a half, and alpha and beta are both equal to one. And this leads to the improved Euler method. And this method also has some advantages, that it only involves function evaluations at the ends of the time intervals. And this can sometimes be beneficial if we might only have data that lives on discrete time intervals. The third named set of parameters has a equal a quarter, b equal three quarter, and 
alpha equal two thirds and beta equal two thirds. And this leads to Ralston's method. And Ralston's method is based on using that additional freedom in order to minimize one of the leading order error terms. And we'll now take a look at a numerical example that will demonstrate these three different second order runge cutter methods. Let's now look at the program order2.py that can demonstrate the three two-step second order runge cutter methods that we introduced in the slides. And in this program, we're going to solve the differential equation y prime is equal to cosine t using the initial condition that y of zero is equal to zero. And this ODE has the exact solution y of t is equal to sine t. If we take a look at the program, we first define our initial time t to be equal to zero and our step size h to be 0 0.05. We then define the right hand side of our differential equation f of t and y, which is equal to cosine t in this case. Now the program will solve the ODE using the three methods that we introduced simultaneously. It will solve using the modified Euler method, the improved Euler method, and also Ralston's method. And here we're going to initialize our initial values of y for the three different methods. We're then going to apply time steps until t reaches a value of six. And within this loop, we're going to calculate our analytical solution, which is just equal to sine t in this case. And we'll print our numerical and analytical solutions and also the differences to the terminal. We'll then implement the three different methods. In the modified Euler step, we first calculate our two intermediate steps. And for modified Euler, our solution is just advanced using the second intermediate step, K2. For the improved Euler step, we calculate our two intermediate steps. And then we advance our solution using an equal weighting of a half times K1 plus K2. For Ralston's method, we calculate the two intermediate steps and we then advance our solution using a quarter of K1 and three quarters of K2. And we'll then update our time variable. Now let's run this program. And by default, this program outputs its results to the terminal and we'll now run this program again and save the results to a temporary file called out and we'll now look at the results in GNU plot. So I've set GNU plot up to have axis labels and I've also positioned the key and I've defined several strings that I can use for printing out the key. And let me now run a plotting command to look at our results. And so we see that in this case, all three of our methods match our exact solution to high precision. And we see that all three of them match our exact solution of sine t. And we can barely see any differences. So now let's plot the differences. And that will really highlight any differences between the three numerical approaches. And so we see now that our vertical scale is much reduced from before. And the maximum errors that we see are around 0 0.0002 in magnitude. And this is consistent with a second order method. We would expect that our errors will be roughly on the scale of our spacing h here to the square power. We can see, however, that Ralston does even better than modified Euler and improved Euler. 
And let's now look at Ralston by itself. And we can see here that the errors for Ralston are on a scale of 10 to the minus 6. And in fact, for this problem, if we varied our h, we would find that Ralston is giving us third order accuracy. And this is rather surprising since we only set the coefficients in Ralston to give us second order accuracy. So let's now take a look at why we have this remarkable accuracy in this case. To understand the convergence properties of the Ralston method, let's revisit our error analysis of the two-step Runge-Kutta methods. And this was based on performing Taylor expansions of both our exact solution and our numerical solution. And we can break them down into terms at different orders of h. And if we look at order h terms, then in our exact solution, we just had one term of f. And at order h squared, we had two terms of a half times ft plus ffy, where here the subscripts note partial derivatives. If we performed the Taylor expansion for our numerical solution, then order h we had a term of a plus b times f, and at order h squared we had terms of alpha b ft plus beta b ffy. And to achieve second order accuracy, we had to match all of the different terms in these expressions. If we look at the terms involving f, then we require that a plus b is equal to 1. If we look at the terms involving ft, we require that alpha b is equal to a half. And if we look at the terms involving ffy, then we require that b to b is equal to a half. And this gives us three conditions that the four parameters in our second order method must satisfy, leaving us with one additional degree of freedom. Now, suppose that we went further than this and we perform Taylor expansions to order h cubed. Then, in this case, we end up with many more terms and many more partial derivatives emerge. And given that we've already set three conditions for our second order method, we cannot hope to match our exact solution and our numerical solution precisely. However, let's look in detail at Ralston's method. So our Ralston coefficients are a is equal to a quarter, b is equal to three quarters, and alpha and beta are equal to two thirds. And let's focus specifically on the FTT term in our exact and numerical expansions. And if we look at this coefficient for the Ralston method, then we have b alpha squared over two, and if we substitute in our Ralston values, that gives us 3 quarters times 2 thirds squared divided by 2. And that evaluates to a sixth. And we see that in this case, this exactly matches our exact solution term. Of course, there are many other terms in both of these Taylor expansions, and we won't be able to match these. However, we see that all of these terms involve partial y derivatives. And we therefore see that suppose we apply a Ralston method to a problem where f has no y dependence, then all of these terms will vanish. And since we are matching the only term that doesn't vanish, the FTT term, then we will achieve third order accuracy. And this is the reason why we see third order accuracy for the case when f is equal to cosine of t. Now, this analysis suggests that if f depends on y, then we will not see third order accuracy for the Ralston method. And we'll now check this result. Let's now revisit our program and modify it to solve a differential equation that no longer just depends on t and also has some explicit y dependence. And I've chosen the equation y prime is equal to e to the minus t squared divided by 2 minus yt using the initial condition that y of 0 is equal to 0. And this ODE has the exact solution y of t is equal to t e to the minus t squared divided by 2. 
and let me now modify this program to solve this differential equation. So our function f here will return the exponential of 0.5 times t times t minus y times t. And our analytical solution here will be t times the exponential of minus 0.5 times t times t. And let me now go ahead and run this program again. And let me now plot the results. And again, we see that all three of our methods match our exact solution to a high level of accuracy. However, let's now modify our program to look at the differences between the numerical solutions and the exact solution. And so in this case, we see that all three methods have comparable accuracy. And Ralston no longer does much better. And this matches our error analysis. And this example demonstrates that the performance of a numerical method is heavily problem dependent. If we're solving ODEs of the form y prime is equal to f of t only, then we see that Ralston would be an excellent choice. However, for other problems like this one, we see that Ralston will give comparable performance to different methods. And the accuracy of method is ultimately controlled by how well it is able to approximate those higher order terms in the Taylor expansion that are not exactly matched in the method. Now we'll look at runge cutter methods that make use of four evaluations of our function f. And here, a very popular choice is referred to as the classical fourth order method, or RK4. And this is widely used, and it's implemented, for example, in MATLAB's function ODE45. And here, our numerical solution yk plus 1 is given by yk plus h divided by 6 times k1 plus 2k2 plus 2k3 plus k4. And here, k1 is given by f of tk yk, k2 is given by f of tk plus h over 2, yk plus h over 2 times k1, k3 is given by f of tk plus h over 2, yk plus h over 2, k2, and k4 is given by f of tk plus h, yk plus h k3. And if we did an analysis of the truncation error, similar as we did for the runge cutter methods with two intermediate steps, then we could verify that the truncation error is order h to the 4 for this method. We can also evaluate the stability properties for the runge cutter methods applied to our standard test problem, y prime equal lambda y. And the figure shown here shows the stability regions for runge cutter methods from orders 1 to 4. And here we see that for the order 1 method, we just have the Euler stability region that corresponds to this unit circle centered on minus 1, 0 in the complex plane. For higher order methods, we see that the stability region actually grows slightly. And it's worth noting that for low order runge cutter methods, the stability regions don't actually depend on the specific choices of coefficients in the method. And here, for example, if we look at the stability region for the order 2 Runge-Cutter methods, then that region is actually common 
between all of the different choices such as improved Euler, modified Euler or Ralston. If one looks at stability regions for higher order or more complicated methods, then one can no longer just describe them in terms of their order. As mentioned at the start of this video, we use the butcher tableau as a general way to describe different runge cutter methods. And suppose that we have an S plus 1 stage runge cutter method. Then we can describe it using the following grid of coefficients. We have a column of coefficients alpha 0 to alpha s. We have a triangular grid of coefficients beta. And then we have a row of coefficients gamma 0 to gamma s. And with these coefficients, we can define that the ith intermediate step is given by f of tk plus alpha i times h, comma yk plus h times the sum from j equals 0 to i minus 1 of beta i comma j times kj. And once we have these intermediate steps, then we can write down that our numerical answer at the end of the time step will be given by yk plus 1 is equal to yk plus h times the sum from j equals 0 to s of gamma j times kj. And we'll now take a look at the different methods that we described in this video and we'll write down their butcher tableaus. We'll now write down the butcher tableaus for the different methods that we've considered and we'll begin by looking at the forward Euler method which is a first order method and we have the form that yk plus 1 is equal to yk plus h times f of tk and yk and to write this in the standard runge cutter form, we can write down that k1 is equal to f of tk and yk, and then yk plus 1 is equal to yk plus hk1. And if we now look at the butcher tableau for this numerical scheme, then we have that our initial k1 is evaluated at tk, so that allows us to put a zero here, and we're taking one copy of k1, so that allows us to put a one here. So that is the complete butcher to blow for this case. So now let's look at the two-step method. So here we have two intermediate steps, and for k1 we evaluate it at tk, so we put a 0 here. For k2, we evaluate it at tk plus alpha h, so we put an alpha here, and at yk plus beta h k1, and so we therefore put a beta here. And then our solution is given by a parts of k1 and b parts of k2 added to our previous solution, and therefore we put down a and b in this final row. And it's worth now looking at what this would be for the three different named methods that we looked at. So if we look now at modified Euler, that would give us a butcher to blow of the form 0, a half, a half, 0, 1. If we looked at improved Euler, then that would give us a table of 0, 1, 1, a half, a half. And if we looked at Ralston, that would give us a butcher to blow of 0, 2 thirds, 2 thirds, a quarter, 3 quarters. So now let's look at the classical fourth order method where we have the four intermediate steps. So here we'll have a butcher to blow with four rows before the final row. And again, K1 is evaluated at TK, so we'll have a zero here. K2, we evaluate at H over two, so that will give us a half here. And we get a H over two times K1, and that will give us a half here. And for K3, we have again evaluated at tk plus a half, so we'll get a half here, and we get 
k2 times h over 2. So that will give us a half here, and we'll have a 0 here, because we have no parts of k1 in this equation. And for k4, we'll have this value of tk plus h, so we have 1 here, and we have a k3 term here, so we'll have 0, 0, and then 1. And let's look at our expression for yk plus 1. We have that we have 1 over 6, 1 third, 1 third, and 1 over 6 for the weightings of the four intermediate steps.